What's a container? How do you, how do you? That's a great question. So um, a container is my sort of esoteric term for, for anything that, um, in which a perspective and a story lives. So it's anything that's malleable, changeable, movable. Um, this room is a container for this interview. Mm -hmm. um, a yoga studio like that space is a container for a conventional yoga class, but it's not just fourth walls, right? It's, um, it's the music you choose to use. It's the lighting. It's the direction that the mats are facing. Um, so it's the stage mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a Broadway show. It's um, the container is the direction the audience is facing in accordance to the stage. Um, the music, the length of the class, the length of the class, the length of the show, um, what the what the actors are wearing, how they're speaking. So so any sort of deliberate choice about how you're showing up in time and space that can be changed at will. Right. Um, and so you really have to think about what choices am, am I making that are causing people to um, back away and feel isolated, and how can I change that performance, my personal behavior, to end the container in which people are engaging with one another to help them feel like they belong. And I want to reiterate this point that um, the opposite of accountability is entitlement. And so you really want to get your, um, your students, if it's a fitness class or your audience, I, I, in drunk yoga, they're the same. <laughs> it's an audi our audience is our students. Um, to feel accountable for their own experience because in a traditional setting when there's a fourth wall, they feel entitled. You walk in as the fitness instructor and they're like, all right, I paid for this, show me what you got. <laughs> and that's true and that's fair because they paid for this class, yeah. they paid for SoulCycle, they should be entitled to a They want you to do it for them. Exactly, yeah, right. and, and that's the same in a corporate setting. That's why you know, I have a lot of, um, we do a lot of corporate team building events and I have, a lot, I have a lot of conversations with HR folks asking me like, all right, so what are you doing that's different? Because we've been trying to get our people to do yoga in the office for years, no one comes, but they come to, to drunk yoga and they're like, what are you doing that makes people want to show up? Um, because it's the same thing. Um, accountability is the opposite of entitlement. And so if you uh, change the container to let people feel accountable for their own experience, they want to show up all of a sudden because they feel like their voice is being heard. And we do that in such silly ways in drunk yoga. Like I'll ask people to, um, the last person to put their cup on their head has to make up a dance move, but they have to make up a dance move for their peers, mm -hmm. right? I didn't tell them what dance move to do. If I told you, hey, do this now, you'd be like, go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can swear on this, but you'd be like, absolutely not. But in the right container, if I invited you in a silly way to make up a dance move that was uh, to, the, to the benefit of your peers, you would totally do it because social pressure, but then all of your peers would do it too. And then all of a sudden it's a shared experience mm. of belonging. I didn't, I created the container in which you could be accountable for your own dance move. Same with music choices, lighting, the time of the class. There's all sorts of really fun, easy, simple ways to do it. I know it sounds very esoteric, um, but it's quite simple. Does some of that require, because I've, I've done a lot of these events, um, personal development ones, and, and I've yeah. been put in some of these situations. And I, I could imagine, like you say, the container of a yoga studio, if you said to me, right, stand up and do a silly dance, <laughs> I would feel self-conscious sure. and then you'd look at everyone else. And so that would probably prevent me from doing what maybe I would do if mm -hmm. I'm drunk or something. So if you took the alcohol out of the way, does, does some of the creation of a container um, revolve around putting people in a, in, in a, a sort of an unfamiliar state anyway? So there's, it's almost like there's no rules. You, it's not like you have to do this to conform or fit and you almost don't know how to fit into anything because everything's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. it, it, yes. Right, okay. Yeah, that's um, a really great observation and absolutely. It's one of the reasons we make it so cheeky. Uh, the, our branding is very cheeky and provocative and we do it in unconventional places. And I, I recognized after about a year of doing drunk yoga, um, I should say nobody came to my class for about six weeks. Um, one, I was bad at marketing. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and also, I think everyone thought it was a joke. I was first to market with this idea of adding alcohol to yoga, probably for good reason. Um, but then I called the press. I had a friend who wrote for Gothamist, and I said, hey, Rebecca, um, I've got this idea. It's called Drunk Yoga. Would you write about it? And it went very, very viral very quickly. So after teaching nobody, maybe private drunk yoga classes to the owner of this bar for six weeks, um, we were sold out for six months and it grew like wildfire. I even got a book deal. <laughs> um, it, I didn't sleep for two years, we grew so fast. And I just tried everything under the sun, just throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what stuck. 
And so back to my point, to my delight, I realized the alcohol wasn't an important piece of it. Mm. We, we, I would say about 30% of our classes have uh, alcohol in hand. Um, a lot of people choose juice or non-alcoholic beverages. We always have non-alcoholic wine or cocktails. Coffee yoga is a, a big seller for us. Mm. Um, and the games are always present. Um, and so I just want to say that before I, I, I mention, yes, everything we do is provocative. It's not always with alcohol in hand, but um, unconventional space helps a lot. And the way that the teacher presents and starts the performance. So we curate everything very, very um, deliberately, like the music that we choose when people are entering, like how people funnel into the room. Um, the teacher makes it very clear that she or he is the host of the party. So making sure she knows everyone's name at the beginning, um, making people feel like they've just been invited into your home. And um, people usually come because it's, you know, it's a party. Mm -hmm. They usually come with a friend. Um, and so that's a little bit different. We always start with a bit of a happy hour, like 20 minutes, so they can grab a drink, sit down, just chill, talk to their friends, and then we bring everyone up. So it doesn't feel like a fitness class because it's not so serious. Mm. It starts like a party and people feel like, all right, this is a party, so I'll twerk today. <laughs> <laughs>